I hope everyone's having an amazing week, an incredible last day of the month. Now we're just waiting for the father of biohacking to enter. It is an absolute honor to interview him. It's been a long time coming. I was honored to be interviewed on his uh, podcast last month, which was amazing. Dave is here. Dave has requested. Dave Asprey. Sam. <laughs> good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Well, good, good evening. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, quick question. Are you fasting? I am fasting. I'm doing the first of the three fasting hacks, black coffee. I, I knew it. I knew it. Straight into it. Okay. How was your week? Uh, my week has been fantastic. Just uh, not traveling as much has its benefits, right? Absolutely. That kind of ties into the idea of consistency and inconsistency that I touched upon on my page right before our, our right before this interview. Um, because you were touching upon that. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But for everyone that's watching, uh, this is Dave Asprey, the father of biohacking, the founder and CEO of Bulletproof, the uh, creator of the Bulletproof Diet, the innovator of the Bulletproof Coffee. A lot of people know this around the world. And right now, and the host of the award-winning Bulletproof Radio that I had the honor of being a guest on last month. And uh, because of this incredible book, he is now four-time New York Times best-selling author, Fast This Way. Congratulations once again. Thank you. That's amazing. Four times. Never would have thought 10 years ago when I started this little blog, I'm like maybe five people will read this and not go through all of the painful health stuff that I went through uh, that it would lead to you know, any one New York Times bestseller, much less four. So I'm, I couldn't be more grateful and happy. Um, I'm, you're really an inspiration to me because I would, and every time I'm reading um, every single book from every author that I interview, it's just an inspiration for me to start writing. There's always this book that I want to write that I keep on delaying. So this is an, another inspiration for me, another motivation for me. So thank you for that. Um, before we start talking about this book, there's something I have, to, I have to touch upon. What I love about the book is the approach to everything that you've done that led to writing the book, whether it's the cave, visual, the vision quest that you've done, whether it's the way you approached all the miraculous things that you've experienced that you didn't have a logical scientific explanation for. And I love the fact that I love how you approached it the openness, the unconditional acceptance of what you are receiving without judging it, without criticizing, without analyzing it, it happened. And you're accepting oh. it as, the, as your truth. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. That didn't come naturally to me. I come from a family of hardcore engineers. My grandmother's a PhD nuclear engineer. Mm -hmm. And my, my grandfather wrote for Encyclopedia Britannica back when that was a thing under the, the subheading of chemistry. So these like hardcore rational Westernists, grandfather was an atheist. My parents were, you know, uh, same mindset. So we get, I grew up with that going, well, none of that stuff is possible. Therefore, anyone who would think about it is an idiot. <laughs> but when all the stuff that was supposed to work for me to lose 100 pounds, uh, for me to uh, be happy, frankly, didn't work. So I tried fame. I'm 23. I, I sold the first thing ever sold over the internet before the web browser was invented, before e-commerce had a name. And it was a t-shirt that said caffeine, my drug of choice on it, if you guys are wondering a little bit of internet trivia there. And I was in Entrepreneur Magazine, and I'm wearing a double extra large shirt, but I wasn't happy when I, I'm like, I'm kind of famous, at least for my 15 minutes, it didn't do anything. And I made 6 million bucks when I was 26. And I said, I'll be happy when I have $10 million, right? And I lost it when I was 28 anyway. <laughs> so, but it didn't make, I was still miserable. So I'm like, okay, I tried all the Western stuff that's supposed to work. I'm going to have to open my mind because otherwise there's no hope. Right. So then I just became curious about everything. And then I'm willing to go to Tibet and try yak butter tea. And I'm willing to go to the Andes and do ayahuasca before it was cool. And just to become exploratory. And I realized what science is, there's two. There's a kind I was raised in, which has a capital S. And that's a religion. It says that can't happen. Therefore, it didn't. And then there's the kind of science with a small s, which is curiosity. And it means to research which means to look again and to look for the outliers or things that should not be possible. And maybe everyone who says it happened is lying or maybe every now and then something really special happens. And in my life, 
more often than every now and then something really special happens, I think, because I look for it. Science, here's what's interesting about science. Science is probably one of the most tangible, concrete things to a degree, but it constantly evolves, it constantly changes. And people that are so fixated on this is the right way, they're caught up in an extreme. And whenever you're in yeah. an extreme, you're limited because, I mean, there's a lot of things that are just unexplained science that science hadn't caught up, hadn't advanced enough to actually explain what's happening. It doesn't mean that what happened didn't happen. And obviously it's based on human observation and we are, you know, human error is, is, a, is a natural thing we, we keep doing. We make mistakes and that's okay. A lot of information in, in science is corrected over time. So it's really important to keep an open mind. It's really important to have that unconditional acceptance of what we receive. And that was just sprinkled throughout your book. And I love that. I just, uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, there's so many ways for us to start this. So I'm just gonna start with this question because there's so many different ways. Why are people afraid of fasting? Why are people uncomfortable? The ones that are uncomfortable, why are they uncomfortable when it comes to fasting? Well, people are asking for the name of the book. It's Fast This Way is what we're talking about. I just saw a couple of new people jump in. And I was afraid of fasting for three reasons. And this is going back to 2008. Uh, and I said, all right, I've weighed 300 pounds. By the way, guys, I weigh about 200 pounds now. And I knew, because I'd been told forever, that if you don't eat six times a day, you'll go into starvation mode, and then you'll get fatter. And I didn't want to be fatter. I'd managed to lose a bunch of, of weight. So I'm like, I don't want to get fatter. If I don't eat all the time, I'll get fatter, which is totally just bad programming. That's not real. <laughs> but I believed it, right? And they also, the words, there's, your body goes into starvation mode. Starvation is a, a fear thing. But the bigger fear for me uh, was that if I am hungry, I will be hypoglybitchy. I'll be hangry. I am unkind to people when I'm hungry. At least I used to be. Now it's not a thing. So, okay, I'm going to act like a jerk <laughs> and I'm going to get fatter and I'll get in starvation mode. It's no wonder fasting is the least appealing, most offensive thing that I could think of, you know, as a, a normal Westerner. But I said, all right, I also know that I eat when I'm lonely. So I hired a shaman to drop me off uh, in a cave in the middle of the desert with no people and no food anywhere for four days. So I can get as mad as I want. <laughs> I can get as starvation-y as I want. And it, it just doesn't matter. I'm going to have to face all of that stuff. And if I'm lonely and I want to eat, it doesn't matter. I can't eat. So that was a really big thing for me. And I said, this is the first time I've ever uh, done a fast. Uh, I'd done you know, a little bit of you know, having coffee in the morning sort of thing, experimenting with bulletproof coffee in the morning, but I wouldn't have called that an intermittent fast back then. And what I discovered during that is, is laid out in the course of the book, uh, but you overcome those fears. And by the end of the thing, on the fourth day, I had more energy than I'd had in years. I, I actually walked 10 miles in the desert, climbed the wrong mountain on my way out. <laughs> a little bit of hijinks happened, but it was just so effortless. And mm -hmm. It blew my mind because I had believed that you would be disabled if you didn't eat for four days. But the reality is that you can go a long period of time. And what's happening here is a very common thing in that your cells in the body run an operating system and they, they run rules. And you imagine if you're just an amoeba or just a single cell, you can't do a lot of, of complex things because you don't have a brain. So you have to follow these basic things. And there's four F words that I write about in the book in order that all life, whether you're a tree, whether you're a bacteria, a worm, a human, a sheep, it doesn't matter. And the first thing you do is you run away from kill or hide from scary things. It's fear. And you take all of your energy and you put it there. And this is because if something eats you, it's the end of your chance to keep your species alive. And, and you don't have to think about that. That is automatic stuff. Yeah. And it's the, you don't have to think about it. That's what gets us in trouble. So that's 10 times more effort and focus than anything. The second F word is food because famines have killed everything that's alive when you run out of nutrients. So this is why you eat everything in front of you without thinking about it sometimes. It's because your cells wanted you to do it. You didn't even have a chance to think about it. They thought about it for you, right? And that gets about five times more attention than it really needs in the world we have now. And 
The third F word is something all life has to do to stay alive for generations. What's that, Sam? I don't know. <laughs> fertility. I, I don't know what you're thinking about. I was thinking about fertility. Yeah. Is yeah. Some other F word come to my mind? <laughs> no, I have no idea. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. But, so, but those three things, they, they drive so much of what we do unconsciously. Yes. Everything, everyone listening to us today has, that they've done they're ever ashamed of came from ancient operating systems. If you think about it, there's nothing you've done. Procrastination, that's fear of something. Um, you know, going, dating the wrong people, staying in relationships, you should do all that stuff is driven by ancient bacteria embedded in our cells. And it's no wonder that fasting is really challenging because it pushes the food button and it pushes the fear button at the same time. So it's the hardest thing to write a book about fasting because really it's just unappealing on its, on its face, right? It's easy to write a book that says, step one, don't eat for a while, step two, it's good for you. But to write about the psychology of fasting and how to make it a lifestyle, one way to do it is you just like get so charged up, yeah, I got this and you like put all the, all of your energy into it and you're just going to will your way through it. And that's what you do on a spiritual fast, which is part of the book. Okay. You know, I'm going to rest. I'm going to reflect. I'm going to journal. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do the things that are spiritual and I'm going to take it easy. That's kind of what I was doing in the cave. But then we have people saying, well, you should fast Monday morning when you've got kids in the house who wouldn't have been in the house. You've got a job, you've got pressure. It turns out there's a working fast. And there's a spiritual fast and they're different things, but they're both fasting. So then how do we make working fasts so that they are better than having breakfast? So you actually have less investment of time, energy, and money. You have more energy and right? more focus. And it actually works better than the way you did it before. At that point, you would totally do it. And that's, that's what the book is about. How do you do both of those at the right time and with the right techniques? So if we were if we for if we were to kind of break down a couple of definitions and a couple of distinctions, make a couple of distinctions here, what is the difference in a nutshell between a working fast and a spiritual fast? A spiritual fast is usually longer. And on a spiritual fast, you don't exercise, you don't interact as much uh, with family and with the world at large, and you spend time inwardly reflecting. And some very, interesting thing, uh, some very interesting things happen during a fast, um, that some of which are more of, of a spiritual component, but which can also apply to your business day. And when your body has food in the stomach, some percentage of your energy goes into breaking down the food. And when it's breaking down food, it's not going into your brain. It's not going into repairing your cells. It's actually going to making more energy. When your stomach is empty, you get more energy because you don't have to work on food <laughs> and that can go into your brain. But then what's really interesting is the next step of that when you're fasting and you go into ketosis, which is when your body is burning fat instead of burning carbohydrates, which you get tiny traces of this after about 12 hours. If you use the hacks in the book, it happens faster. And if you go on a multi-day fast, it always happens. And ketones provide more energy for your neurons than normal metabolism with glucose or protein. And this is a big deal because now you actually are feeling more power and you're wasting less power in digesting food. So no wonder, okay, I got it. Like I'm feeling really good. And a final thing happens, which is more esoteric, but is real. And that is when your body is hungry, it naturally opens up your sensors. And these ancient mitochondria that power your cells they're actually environmental sensors that then make energy or hormones or neurotransmitters based on what they sense. But when you're without food for especially a day or two, they're like, oh, we've got to be paying attention to the world around us. And suddenly you become more aware. You go for a walk on a spiritual fast and you see the forest better. You see the desert better. You see the animals. Everything becomes crisper. Things smell different. The colors change. This is your body becoming more connected to the world around you. And when you say, oh, I have more energy, more focus, and more energy, I'm not wasting as much energy, I have more focus, and I have more sensors open. Well, you can do a lot. You sit down with a journal, or you sit down and meditate, or sit down and pray. And you've got more to, to offer, because your body's in that special state. That's what happens on a spiritual fast. But you can take those same techniques and say, I'm going to turn this into the best day at work ever, because my energy is even, because I'm dialed in, because I'm focused, because I feel good. It's when people try to do the spiritual stuff 
and they're trying to work at the same time that it gets pretty scrambled. And so it's okay to say today I'm fasting for 18 hours and it's, I might have a morning practice like I do, um, but it's not the focus of the day. The focus of the day is my, you know, get stuff done day, right? But maybe on Saturday or Sunday or maybe next week, or maybe I'll take a couple of days off, but I'm going to do a longer fast. Just don't mix them up. They're, they're really important to understand. And that was why in the book, a lot of modern fasting books are all science, science, science. There's plenty of science in my books. Yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> but um, this, this side of understanding the psychology, the emotion, the spirituality of fasting, it is so important. And if you try to divorce that from, from just the, how to eat, when to eat, things like that, it doesn't work as well. You've got you to gotta acknowledge that. It's an important part because fasting has been in every major and minor practice of spirituality or religion going back forever like it this is a core part of humans we just lost it in in the west especially because a food company told us to eat six times a day and we believed it that's yeah here's the thing about the idea of frequency because one of the reasons for frequency is you maintain blood sugar at a certain level you don't create glucose spikes to create insulin spikes, which increases the anabolism mm -hmm. state, right? What you're saying in terms of fasting and in terms of, for example, intermittent fasting is staying for, you know, cessating from food for a long time um, does allow the glucose to drop. But then again, you prevent the, the anabolic state, despite the fact that you're not doing it frequently enough to maintain a regular blood sugar level. So, there's, there's a lot of complexity there. Let me explain that a little bit on the, okay. the science front. Yeah. There's two major hallmarks of fasting, uh, things that happen in the body. One of them is a compound called mTOR. And mTOR is something that puts the body in growth mode. It's a signaling molecule in the body. And when we eat all the time, whether it's particularly protein or carbs will do it as well, it raises mTOR, which is okay, growth mode, I'm going to put on muscle, you know, this, this is a good thing. Well, except it's not. <laughs> because if you're always in growth mode, you're in cancer mode. And this is why too much protein all the time does increase your risk of cancer. However, going on a plant based or a no protein diet isn't going to be good for you either. So what you want to be able to do is say, how do I get my mTOR levels to be exceptionally high when I want to put on muscle and low the rest of the time? And fasting is perfect for that. Because mTOR is like a spring. You smash it down, and then it comes surging forth. The way you smash it down is you fast, you drink coffee, <laughs> or probably strong tea would do it too, but most of the studies are on coffee, uh, and you exercise, especially weight-bearing exercise. So if you do what I say in the book, you fast for at least 12, ideally you know, 14, 16, 18 hours, you drink some coffee during the fast and you exercise at the end of the fast on an empty stomach. Then you eat protein and carbs. You've now compressed mTOR so much that as soon as you eat that, it goes up through the roof and then your body sucks in all the nutrient and you get more return on your investment than you did before. So you can exercise less and get better results. And when you're done with that, magically your mTOR can return back to a lower level. So then you get the benefits of being able to put this on. But with fasting, the mTOR is down. So that's one of the hallmarks of fasting. And I just explained that tripling down on mTOR technique from the book, which to put it really bluntly for people listening, exercise at the end of your fast, drink coffee during the fast, and then eat right after you exercise. That's the recipe for that. Then the next thing is insulin. Insulin needs to not go up. Blood sugar needs to not spike during fast. What this means though is that if you're like I was, overweight, insulin resistant, pre-diabetic, if you were to sit down in the morning and say, today I'm going to fast, I'll just have water. By 11 a.m., I would have been completely yelling at my colleagues or falling asleep at my desk. I would have been cold, shaky, maybe nauseous, and it would not have worked. So how do you go to the point where I did a three-day fast in the middle of my book launch just because I wanted the, to be dialed in for that? So how do you go to that from where most people are in the world today? Well, the way you do it is there's three fasting hacks in the book. And you can do stuff during a fast. You can eat things or drink things as long as insulin doesn't change, as long as mTOR doesn't change. And I am very famous for bulletproof coffee because 
I've been using it with intermittent fasting for 10 years. I've helped people lose more than a million pounds. And this is across the globe. Um, I think the book's now in 16 or 18 languages and it's still going strong. And it's, it's incredible because, in fact, I know it's very strong in the UAE, uh, in, in Saudi. It, it's pretty incredible. I was out there, I was in Oman, people were, were drinking. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, it's, it's a global phenomena. But when you do this, which is grass-fed butter, MCT oil, in, blended into coffee, and it has to be blended. It was inspired by uh, something I had in Tibet, yak butter tea. And you do that, and well, what happens? Your insulin stays constant. That's been validated by third parties. And your mTOR stays low because fat doesn't raise mTOR. So people do that, and all of a sudden, they get massive energy because there's ketones from the MCT oil because the, they can metabolize the water from the coffee differently because of the small amount of butter that's in it. And all of a sudden, like, I don't care about food. And it's the, I don't care about food. Because if when you're fasting in a working fast and all you can think about is donuts, <laughs> you are not going to have a very good work day. But if instead you do this and you go, I just don't care about food. Someone puts a donut in front of you and you don't even want it because you have enough energy for the first time in your life. That's a pretty big deal. That's right? amazing. Th that's the idea. And there's another thing called prebiotic fiber you can put in, uh, which is something that feeds your good gut bacteria. And it's very satiating. So there's, if, if I went back to my, you know, 26 year old or 23 year old, whatever, 300 pound self. And I had given myself a cup of coffee with grass fed butter and <laughs> oil and prebiotic fiber and I drank it for breakfast. I would have been too full to want to eat. Yet I would have been in a fasted state because my insulin was low, my mTOR was low, but I would have felt amazing. And when people do this, they build resilient, flexible metabolisms that can burn carbs, can burn fat, and they start to lose weight and I have lots of data to support that now. And they, not only do they start to lose weight, but they become better able to say, I'll just have black coffee today or I'll even just have water. The name of the book, Yousef, is Fast This Way. Um, it just came out. Okay, so that makes sense because what, what you're basically saying is maintaining mTOR is the issue, lowering mTOR and then allowing it to spike when we need it and then it crashes again is really the yep. key but utilizing mTOR when we need it instead of keeping it high the whole time because there's a risk that comes with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The, sorry, you wanted to? I was gonna say that the risk is cancer, but it's also just aging. When your mTOR is high all the time, you're always in build mode, but you're never in break cells down mode. And that mode is called autophagy. And when you fast, all that digestive energy that went into breaking down whatever's in your stomach, your body says, I got nothing to break down right now. How about I break down some of these old cells, things I call in my aging book, um, I call them zombie cells. <laughs> and these are cells that they're not quite dead, but they aren't doing what they're supposed to do. They're sort of floating around, taking up energy and making free radicals, but they're not contributing to the system. When you're not always eating, the body says, oh, I've got time and attention to go out and clean up these old cells. It actually will destroy the cells. Imagine like the old billboards where, where they have light bulbs screwed in, you know, hundreds of light bulbs. Well, some of the bulbs are dim. When you stop eating, your body will take out the dim bulbs and put in bright bulbs so they're all the same brightness. When you can make more energy, when you can do a better job of combining 30 pounds of air and some amount of food to make electrons, you actually show up better for your spiritual practice. You show up better for your family, for your community, for yourself more energy, I mean like electrons energy, like in a battery, but more in your brain equals better progress in your life at anything you put your time and attention on. And most people, at least in the US, I have some data on this, 88% of people are metabolically unfit. Their cells don't do a good job of turning air and food. We don't have great global data, but you can track it with obesity. So 42% of Americans are obese, 88% are metabolically unfit. So you can take the obesity rate in your country and basically double it. That's the number of people who have lost the knowledge and ability to turn air and food into the maximum amount of electricity to show up in the world. It's that big of a deal. Just to answer people, I mean, a lot of people are asking, I'm probably gonna be doing this a couple of times, even though it's reverse, I'm just gonna just do that every couple of minutes maybe. Fast This Way is the name of the book. The author that I have the honor of speaking to right now is Dave Asprey. Um, there are a couple of distinctions that I'd like to make the difference between hunger and craving, and I'm just quoting your book, hunger is a biological message and it is something that you can control. Craving is a psychological need and it is something that tries to control you. 
When it comes to turning off, the, the hacks to turn off, are we turning off hunger or craving? You're turning off hunger. Okay. Cravings are something you can turn off, but it's a different thing. And I didn't know there's a difference between hunger and cravings because I always, and throughout my entire life, I'm like, man, if I don't eat, I, I feel like I'm just going to die. I need to get this intense need, this focus on, like, I really have to eat. And it, it's like a gnawing hunger. Well, that was always caused by me. It was caused by something that I ate in the meal before. So if you wake up in the morning, like, I really have to eat and you're starving, you ate dinner wrong. It's okay. You ate something that was a trigger. And in Fast This Way, in the book, I list five common sources of cravings from what you eat. And a beauty of fasting is that it makes you more aware of what your last meal did to you. Because you wake up today, you're like, oh, I'm not hungry at all. In fact, it's two in the afternoon. I don't even want to eat. Well, you did a good job on dinner last night. <laughs> but if instead you wake up and you're like, man, I'm just focused on food and focused on food, something's causing that. And it's most likely what you ate. It could be that you slept really terribly, or it could be that you're exposed to some kind of toxins. You breathe a lot of paint fumes. It'll make you have profound sugar cravings because your body says, could I have some glucose to oxidize all this crap you just put in my liver? Like those actually are real, but yeah. there's also the emotional requirements for eating and fasting will help you face those as well, but you have to face them. And that was for me, oh, I'm lonely. I think I'll eat which is different than I feel like I'm going to die if I don't eat something right now. And that's a craving. What hunger is, is a gentle feeling. So now at the end of a fast, um, I'll probably have one meal today around 2 p.m. And around, oh, probably one or two, I will get this, um, I'll get a feeling that says, you know, it's probably about time to eat. But if I didn't eat, I'd be fine. And it's just, it, it's like an awareness. And it's so relaxing right? To say, I know, and I know cognitively, but my tissues also know the truth. The truth is that it takes you about 90 days to starve to death. So if you tell yourself, I am starving because you want lunch, you're not starving. You're not even in the universe of starving, right? Um, yeah. There are people who fasted for 70 days who are alive today. And if you look in any book, uh, whether you're looking in the Quran in the Bible, you know, people fast for 40 days all the time. It's, it's like, you know, they do it all, every other week. They fast for 40 days. Okay, can't really do that. <laughs> but they, uh, uh, so we know we can do it. Yes. But it's intense if you're going to go that long. You, I'm not suggesting people do that. But it's really interesting that we believe we are starving if we don't have food <laughs> every few hours. That belief is, is embedded in your tissues. Your body also believes that you can't, you know, lift something um, that's heavy. Right? And the reason you push a little bit harder is you're actually showing the body, oh, you can. And the body says, oh, if I'm going to have to do that regularly, maybe I should put on some more muscle. Right? It's the same thing. Fasting is a form of weightlifting for your cellular metabolism. And you show the body, oh, you can do that. Not only can you do it, you're going to have to do it again. And then the body becomes stronger. But this is the kind of strength that stops diabetes, which is the precursor to cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. So fasting is cool. The first time you do it and you do it right, you didn't spend any time and energy on breakfast, but you had more energy and focus during the day. So you, you got paid by not making breakfast. You got more energy, so you got return on your non-investment. And then over time, you get an investment of not getting old and weak and then dying prematurely. So it's the best, highest return on investment activity that there is in terms of health, and it's got spiritual benefits as well. Absolutely, absolutely. The um, idea of fasting, one of the benefits was that it increases hippocampal volume. Yes. Yes. What's interesting about that is gratitude has, based on studies, has been proven gratitude, practicing gratitude to increase and enhance hippocampal volume. And I started thinking of the link between gratitude and fasting because fasting allows you to create some sort of a selective uncoupling of something that you want. And it allows you, it enhances your appreciation of it. So it indirectly stimulates gratitude, which can create that. But I think there's something else happening as well. Because with selective deprivation or uncoupling, you are desensitizing yourself from the fear of loss, the fear that comes from that scarcity of not having what you think you need to have. And gratitude really is a way to counter scarcity. 
that inner sense of being scarce, of not being enough, of not having enough, of not doing enough, by being grateful for what you have, for the people you know. So there's this, it's an interesting kind of connection of abundance to counter scarcity and fasting as an indirect way. So I thought it was just interesting to share. That's a, that's a really good point, Sam. When you, you look at fasting, you can actually consciously practice gratitude that you get to choose to fast. Because there are somewhere around a billion people on the planet who are fasting involuntarily at any time or another. Uh, yeah. So, and also when you eat, uh, I, I like to tell the story about my son. He was maybe eight and he's seen me fasting for years. And he said, Daddy, I want to try a fast. And I said, okay. Alan, I don't recommend fasting for kids and it's not a good thing. You can fast every now and then if you want to try it, but I wouldn't want you to do intermittent fasting every single day. You know, your cells need to know the world is full of abundant food so you build a thriving, strong body. So fasting isn't for kids to answer one of the questions that was in our thread here. But fasting occasionally or having a late breakfast because they're not hungry, that's good for kids. But he says, okay, I'm going to go 24 hours without food. Like, wow, Alan, that's, that's awesome. Uh, you're not allowed to do that very often, but if you want to try it, you can. He, and I said, why don't you do one of the fasting hacks? Like have some coffee, have a little bit of bulletproof coffee, and then you won't feel the hunger as much. He goes, no, I want to see if I can do it. So he only had water for 24 hours. And at the end of that, and, and there, there was no encouragement here. This is just him saying, I want to do it. I've seen you do it. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to see it. Like I want to run a marathon. I want to see. And at the end of it, when he had, he did it, he was a little bit tired, a little bit cranky, but not bad. And at dinner, he ate dinner and he goes, you're right, daddy. Fasting is the best spice ever. This is the best meal I've ever had. It tastes so good. And so you can have gratitude when you eat those. Like when you eat at the end of a fast, you're like, oh, I can, I can do that. And it feels really good. And so that's where gratitude comes in. Gratitude when you eat and gratitude that you get to choose not to eat. And both of those make fasting better. And you can do that in a working fast or a spiritual fast. It also enhances, I mean, obviously it, it heightens your senses. So you get to appreciate um, because that is a byproduct of fasting anyway. So when you eat, in addition to that, it actually heightens your appreciation because you get to taste things that you normally wouldn't. And I remember you were mentioning something in the book about a guy that actually smelled, was it a sandwich or something? Or what yeah. Was that was. The, this is my friend, Chris. He's a, a long range uh, recon guy in the military and these are the guys they drop them off in jungles and countries where they probably shouldn't be and then they disappear for a month and magic stuff happens and during his training he was telling me this and i just had a hard time believing it but they'd give him an 80 pound backpack and say you and your team it's going to be three days you have no food <laughs> you're going to go through the jungle and you're going to find this gps coordinate uh, using just a compass and uh, we'll see you there and pick you up and bye. <laughs> and the helicopter leaves and that's that. So what they would do though, is they'd hang a cheeseburger in a tree by the point where they were uh, going to uh, the point they were looking for. And he said, Dave, when we were three miles away, every one of us could smell the cheeseburger. It, it was readily apparent. And this is the sensors opening in the body. And when you study the shamanic oriented trackers, you know, people who live uh, closer to nature. Um, and this is true in, in all cultures. You go to an island nation, they, they are connected to the water and they can see the waves in a certain way. They're connected. You go into the desert. There's tons of life. I grew up in a desert. There's tons of life in the desert and you, you know where it is because you're with it. And in this case, the sensors open up all the way. Tom Brown Tracker School is another example. This is a guy who teaches shamanic techniques of, of tracking. And he says, oh, let's do it fasted. And suddenly you, you know where all the animals are around you because your body always knew that. You just never had the sensors open for it. So that's, that's why it's a powerful practice. And I'm seeing lots of questions about Ramadan in the thread here. Yeah. And yeah. I, I actually cite studies. Please, go ahead. Please get into it. Yeah, I cite studies in the book. And there's a whole, the, in the chapter on spiritual fasting, this is one of the most practiced forms of spiritual fasting that's out there. And what you're doing there is a substantially long fast. It's at least you know, 12, 14, 16 hours, depending on that. And there's studies of improvements in people's metabolism from it. And of course, there's the spiritual aspect of it. Right? So all day long, you're thinking about it. And what's interesting about Ramadan is that it's a dry fast, which is a, a more um, advanced form of fasting because you're not drinking water during the day, at least if you're practicing it. Some people get an excuse if you're pregnant and things like that. But 
Um, what happens there is what happens when anyone tries intermittent fasting over time is that your metabolism gets healthier, your brain turns on. But there is a fourth F word. Remember those, those three um, F words I talked about before, fear, food, and fertility. The fourth F word that all life does is friend, right? And you support your community. We take care of our elders. We take care of our children. We help people. We specialize. You know, we become a teacher. We become what we do for our community and all that stuff. And that, that final F word is important because when you fast in a community, really good stuff happens. Um, in fact, for Fast This Way, um, if you go to fastthisway.com, um, you can sign up for a free fasting challenge. There's 30,000 people fasting together. And that's incredible. And I am actually teaching the book like this. Um, and it's just, I just want people to have the knowledge. So it's not a, a pay thing. It's a, a free thing. But um, th when you go into the Facebook group and you look at the comments from people, you see people saying, I have never fasted for 24 hours in my life. I didn't think I could do it. And it's the emotional equivalent of running a marathon. It, it's a big deal because it blows your mind. I can't believe this is possible, much less that I could do it and feel like myself, right? So you feel like you have faced death. But if you're someone who's, you know what? Since I was 12, <laughs> I've been fasting without water for at least 12 hours a day. You probably know you can do it because it was something you did with your community that was built in. I would like to see fasting uh, become a worldwide thing uh, that we do on a regular basis where we, we just honor that. Uh, the, the model I like to imagine, what if in order to get gas for your car, if you still have a gas burning car, which most people still have, um, what if you always Tuesday morning just filled up with gas, even if you didn't eat, even if your tank was full and you didn't drive? That's what we're doing every day. Everyone sit down and eat, like, but I don't need to eat. It doesn't matter. You eat now. Well, it would make no sense because what you're doing is you're pumping gas out until it flows out onto the, you know, onto the driveway. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what we're doing. And some of the technology that's available now, Sam, is, is amazing. I have this thing called levels on the back of my arm right here. I can wave my phone over that and it tells me my blood sugar. So I'm feeling hungry Amazing. and I look at my blood sugar and my blood sugar is you know, 105. Like I have plenty of available energy in my body. My body's just not using it. So it's sending me a false signal. Those ancient sensors are like, eat the donut, right? But I'm like, nah, sorry, I, I've got data. And so then I can better correlate my, my instrumentation you know, we aren't born with a manual and there's all sorts of knobs and dials and sensations and feelings and they aren't labeled. And over, over, as we evolve and mature, we become more and more aware of what those mean. But when you have a little bit of data showing you, you know what, that wasn't really hunger. That was something else because clearly I have enough energy. Maybe my cells aren't using energy. Then I should work on my metabolism. Maybe I'm lacking a nutrient or something, but just knowing I have enough energy, I don't need to eat. What's going on here? You suddenly realize that eating is something we do way more than we need to. And frankly, it's because eating tastes good. It feels good. Of course so, it does. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of there are people talking about Ramadan, so I just want to clarify something. There is a way to fast in Ramadan that isn't healthy. And there are people that do that. So the, one of the unhealthy things that, unfortunately, there are several individuals in, I mean, you, you can, we can find that in different countries in the Middle mm -hmm. East, where after fasting, when they break the fast, um, at the end, when they break the fast, they indulge, they overeat. So it's the amount, and I guess it's the type of food that we eat that damages the effect. But the idea is we're not supposed to, if we actually go back to the sunnah on how to actually do it, we're not supposed to eat too much when you break the fast. It's very light, but a lot of people eat heavy and that's not the healthy way to do it. The second thing is there are three levels to fasting in Ramadan. The first one is the physical. No food, no water, no sex during the day. The second is the kind of sensory, physiological, motor kind of fasting, which involves, for example, tongue fasting, where for the entire 30 days, you want to heighten the, the depth of that fasting. You, you basically fast. Tongue fasting is basically not uh, lying, not gossiping, not cursing, not... So that's an example. And you can kind of use that for any other part of the body, really. The things to avoid, the things to avoid in terms of receiving or the things to avoid in terms of, you know, motor stimulation. The third is the spiritual, which is dedicating the entire month to doing all that, but just focusing 100% on God. That's it. 
And these are the three levels. So just to kind of clarify that, because there are certain people, there are different individuals asking about that. Um, I'd like to touch upon a couple of more distinctions. Before we go there, Sam, yeah, I, can I get a word in there? Because please. yeah, the real definition of fasting is to go without. And it doesn't mean to go without food always. You can fast from junk food. It's called eating healthier. You can fast from carbs. It's called keto. And I talk about a dopamine fast in the book, which is fasting from um, things that are overstimulating. And that's part of what you're talking about there with, with Ramadan, right? And so this is one you know, where you're focusing on more peaceful, more calm things, you know, less social media, less you know, explodey movies and things like that, where you're just allowing the body to, to calm down a little bit. And what this does is the same effect that makes food taste good at the end of a fast is that everything that creates pleasure does it more easily if occasionally you go without it. But the, at the end of the book, the hardest fast, the one that I talk about is exactly like your tongue fast. And I ask people, fast from hate. See if you can go four hours without thinking a bad thought about yourself or another person or another thing. And it is one of the hardest fasts to do. And when you first start working on a practice like that, you will find that every five seconds, your brain, the voice in your head, probably says something bad about you or other people. And it's a habit. And the body's doing that for the first F word, fear. It's basically saying they might be a threat. They might be bad. I might not be good enough. If I'm not good enough, no one's going to love me. And you're not choosing these thoughts. This, this is not you. This is an ancient defense system. The same thing that makes you pull your hand away from a hot fire before you notice it's hot. <laughs> it's that system that's making you think all these negative thoughts and all. But when you become aware of it, you can actually train it like you train a dog to not do that very often. And when you do it, talk about freeing up energy. 15% of the average person's thoughts every day are about what's for the next meal. If you can stop thinking about food, you get 15% of your thoughts back. If you can stop thinking about fear, you probably get 50% more thoughts back. And that's why it's actually really advanced technology that's behind Ramadan when you're doing the three levels you're talking about there. Even the no sex during the day, I talk about fasting from sex in the book, right? And it's different for men and women. There's different effects. But yeah, there's a really, there's, there's raw electron energy power that comes from all these practices. And there's also uh, something around just not wasting a lot of your electrons on this stuff in your head that doesn't belong there. And this is on a spiritual path. It's also on a, a path of performing better. So there's a direct correlation between spirituality and showing up in your life for everything you do better. And it's been really transformative for me. Fast. Okay. The, that's, that's something I wanted to touch upon later, but since you brought Okay. It, sorry. Uh, I took it in no, sideways. No, no, let's talk about it now. No, no. Let's talk about it now. So uh, first of all, I admire the fact that you mentioned that in terms of fasting from hate because a lot of people wouldn't even acknowledge that they have hate towards other people for whatever reason or thinking hateful thoughts about someone that has wronged you. We've been wronged by so many. I mean, everybody's been wronged in some way or form by someone. And I, I just admire the fact that you mentioned that. And that indirectly in its way, in a, in a certain way, is a very powerful thing because um, what I do, what I'm mainly focusing on right now is emotional healing. But part of that is expressing the truth about how you feel. And mm -hmm. there is a uh, study at UCLA by, and I think uh, we touched upon, Amy Chan and I touched upon in the last um, IG Live, I think Dr. Matthew Lieberman, if I'm not mistaken, Matthew D. Lieberman, mm -hmm. he found that expressing, writing down how you feel, specifically it was about anger, um, basically lowers the activity of the amygdala. It's no longer triggered, it's no longer stimulated. And it basically increases the activity of the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex that is responsible for emotional processing and behavioral inhibition. And that in and of itself is a way, because with trauma, there's a circuit. And whenever we talk so in CBT or DBT or just expressing or journaling, we're looking for a better story in a desperate attempt to resolve the conflict inside of us. And whenever we're caught up in thought, when what we need to do is, capture, is release the emotion that is causing the thought, it, this is what I'm basically focusing on, on releasing emotions to change behavior, to change belief, to release the thoughts so they would no longer be there. Because there's a triad, 
belief, behavior, and emotions and self-development, they're all focusing about belief and behavior. And if you change the behavior, that's great. Change the belief, that's great. The thing is a lot of times it reverses. A lot of times it comes back again because the emotion is what puts the belief and behavior. It's what keeps them in place. It's the glue. You melt the glue, belief and behavior is a lot easier to change. A metaphor, a quick metaphor is think of behavior as a branch, think of belief as a trunk, think of emotions as the root. Most people go after symptomatic treatment. They go after the branch, go after the trunk. They don't remove the root. And so they just chop heads of hydra instead of piercing the heart. So that was a really interesting concept because one of the things that you were mentioning about that when you say hate, thought about thinking about hate and fasting from that is, and I love what you said, when you, when you, when you try to fast from hate, you realize how much hate exists around you because you become so sensitive to it. And that's the thing, when we detach from something, we get to see it. So just wanted to touch upon that because I thought that was a really powerful, I think it was chapter seven, that was, in, that was the last part yeah. of your, chapter seven. That was really, really powerful. Um, but just to get back to the distinction, fasting and starvation, just to clarify for people, we're talking about fasting and the book, once again, fast this way, just put the phone in front of a mirror and you'll see it. Um, <laughs> so, it's fasting versus starvation. Your definition in the book, which simplifies it, is basically fasting is, uncon well, starvation is uncontrolled fasting. So if you're forced to do it and it's uncontrolled, that's starvation. And that's not yeah. what we're at because there's damage there, especially that you're not in control of it. And I think the value of what you're, the way you're framing fasting, I love what you, how you framed it as an opportunity and whether it's diets or not, whether it's related to food or not, it's an opportunity to gradually introduce the possibility of changing a behavior. So fasting yeah. is, is kind of like dipping your toes into the opportunity of changing a behavior. Just test it, see how it feels like. You'll probably discover that if you stop something for seven days, you're more likely to be, that gives you more confidence to actually stop it. Instead of saying, I wanna stop now, it's a very nice gradual introduction to stopping something because you get, instead of fearing the unknown of what would happen if I do it, well, do it temporarily. The power of impermanence, do it for three days. See what happens. You realize nothing happens you can do and you can do it. So that actually changes everything. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And um, two more distinctions that I'd like to ask you to clarify. Fasting, we'll start with the first one. Fasting and dieting, are they similar? Are they different when people talk about both? A lot of people are attracted to fasting because they think it's a way to lose weight. Any diet that works, weight loss is a side effect. You eat for energy. That's our job. That's what food is for. So if, if you eat so that you have no cravings, so that your brain is focused, so that you feel really good, you will lose weight as you do that. And if the diet is one that makes you lose weight but not feel good, what will happen is you will gain all the weight back and then some. I didn't really lose 100 pounds. I probably lost 200 or 300 pounds. You lose 20 pounds, you gain 30. You lose 30, you gain 40. Yeah. And partly that's because I wasn't using intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting helps to reset your hunger level to be at the level of your current body weight. But if you do what I did, which was... I went on a low fat, low calorie diet, and I worked out six days a week for an hour and a half a day for 18 months. You'd say, wow, you should have looked great. No, I still had a 46 inch waist. I still weighed 300 pounds and I could max out all the machines at the gym. And I was overtraining and I was undernourished. So you can do that and it's not good for you. Many people will lose weight under regimen like that, but many people won't because there are other variables like hormones and like I said, overtraining. So what you want to be able to do when you're looking at, at any sort of a diet is say, look, if it's a temporary thing, it's not going to work. What you want to do is learn how to eat in a way that makes you feel amazing all the time. And when you do that, your pants, you're gonna have to buy smaller pants. But if you eat in a way to have to buy smaller pants, that doesn't make you feel good. You will stop doing it because what we value most as human beings is having more energy. It is number one because more energy equals more love, more relationships, more impact on the world, more growth, more evolution, more everything. But if you eat a low energy diet for long periods of time, and yeah, I'm talking to you vegans. 
<laughs> what what you're going to end up with is and I was a raw vegan for a long time, so I, I've been there and done that as well. Have, how long have you had the or you? I eaten? I was a raw vegan for about a couple of years, uh, and it made me profoundly ill. It actually took me about three years to climb out of that, and I've got tens of thousands of people on the bulletproof diet recovering from being a vegan. You can usually pull it off in your early twenties, but you're burning long term <laughs> long term resources to do it. It it just doesn't work very well. Uh, from a health perspective, because it's got the wrong fats in it. And that's a subtext of the book. If you're eating all plant-based fats, your body's not made out of those. And it actually changes all of your bulbs to be weak bulbs over time, because you must have saturated fat and certain nutrients in the diet that you can't get, no matter how much you want to get them from plants. So I'm fine if you want to be vegan for a week, but you've got to refill with stuff. And if you can add, like you would find more in India, where let's have some butter, even if we're vegetarian, that works. But it's the fat that's so precious because every cell in your body, the outer envelope of the cell, the cell membrane is made of tiny droplets of fat. So what you want to do is eat in such a way that those little batteries in your cells, the mitochondria, those bulbs, they're also made out of fat. You give them the right fats, you have bright bulbs. You give them the wrong fats over time, they become dimmer. You don't want to do that to yourself. You'll feel great for the first six weeks of being a vegan. And you want to do a six-week vegan diet? I totally support that. However, you're going to need to go back to replenishing the good fats in the body. Otherwise, it becomes depleting. Yeah, and, also, yeah sorry, go ahead. As in, and and um, I, I mean, people talk about animal cruelty. People talk about um, the effects on the environment. I'm talking about eating grass-fed, locally sourced, regenerative animals that are building soil. Don't eat industrial animals. They're bad for you. <laughs> so there's that. That's outside the realm of fasting. But if you say, I'm going to eat in a way that gives me the most energy, creates a better environment we need animals for the environment in all of the all of the research that I've done. And it's okay to just say I'm gonna do, you know, butter and eggs because I don't want to eat eat an animal. At least the chickens are making chicken poop, which is good for the soil. <laughs> and the cows that make the milk are making cow poop, which is good for the soil, because we really need our soil. That's the skin of the earth. And it's really important that we maintain that. There's there's something that came up as I was reading the book about skipping breakfast. Yes. Yeah. I remember Tim Ferriss mentioned, I'm, I'm not sure where I read it, but he was basically saying that a lot of people, a lot of successful entrepreneurs, a lot of su successful authors, people that he interviewed, they had one thing in common. They always skipped breakfast. And uh, Andrew Huberman, the uh, neuroscientist was mentioning that skipping breakfast boosts your, boosts dopamine and epinephrine which amplifies yeah. your ability to focus. And then the connection like, okay, so that makes sense that you skip breakfast, that actually helps. But then again, skipping breakfast is already a form of fasting. And I love what you mentioned about sleep in the sense of if you're sleeping for eight hours, then you wake up, you already did an eight hour fast, which I love the way you framed it. Because that means that I'm, if the moment I wake up, I've done an, an amount of fast equivalent to the amount of sleep. Mm -hmm. So if I basically fast for 16 hours and I slept for eight, I just have eight to go, I'm halfway there. And well, it's so even you, better. Have dinner a little bit early, right? It, what if you had dinner at six and yeah. then you went to bed at 10, you got four hours and you sleep for eight hours, you get 12 hours. You wake up at 6 a.m. under what I'm talking about. You can still have breakfast at 10 a.m. and you've done a 16 hour fast and you wait till lunch, you, you got your 18 hours in. So a little bit of an early dinner plus sleep equals you're almost done with fasting. So it's not that big of a deal during the week. But if instead you wake up and say, I have to put sugar and milk in my coffee or in my tea, well, you just broke your fast. Like, don't do that. Put some butter in there instead. It won't break your fast. You'll be all right. I promise. So in terms of the three hour uh, you, you recommend about three hours prior to, to, to sleep, just three or more. I like five if you can pull it off. Like I, I eat dinner at about 5.30 on the average night. And that means if I go to bed at 10.30, I've already got five hours. I sleep, I don't sleep eight hours. In fact, healthy people, the people live the longest sleep six and a half hours, which is my average. I'm not saying you should sleep less. I'm saying when you eat the right stuff, you just need less sleep because you got less toxins and you have more energy. So I got six and a half hours of sleep. I got five hours. I'm already at 11, 12 when I wake up. And then all I have to do is go four hours and I'm there. And quite often, um, if I'm doing the optimal thing that, that really works best, we can go back two billion years to when there were bacteria floating in the ocean that became our mitochondria and there were some cells that were us. Now, 
at night it's cold and dark and there's no food because they ate algae and algae requires sunlight. So basically the mitochondria would sink down into the colder, darker depths of the water and they just kind of hang around. And then as the red light for sunrise came up, then more and more algae becomes present. And when the sun is vertical above, that's when you have the most sunlight and the most food. And then for the two hours between noon and 2 p.m. is when you have the highest level of food availability and the brightest overhead light. And then the food availability starts to go down and the sun starts to go down. And that means if we eat between 12 and 2, we're using food as a signal to our body to say it's the middle of the day. And if we wake up and we see the sun and we have bright lights on, ideally not those LEDs that are a little bit broken, but bright lights or go out at, at noon for a brief walk and you eat the majority of your food in the middle of the day, that is the secondary signal after light to get your, your eyes, your brain, and all the cells and organ systems in the body to know what time of day it is. And when you do that, you sleep like a rock star because most of us today, we see bright lights at night, we look at screens, we have our bathroom LED lights on, so the light is confusing some of our timing systems. And if you eat late at night and you have bright lights at night, half the cells in your body think it's daytime in the middle of the night. And then you do go to sleep, but you don't get good sleep. So I, I talk in one of the chapters in the book about how to use the combination of food and light to reset your clock. So you want to be a morning person? I've never been a morning person in my life. I, in my life, I always have stayed up until 2.04 a.m. since I was maybe 11 years old. I would read. I'm a night owl. But I drop my kids off at school in the morning. I, it's not really that convenient. So I used what I talked about in the book. So I now wake up naturally at 6.30 to 7 a.m. without an alarm clock, which has never happened in my entire life. But if I was to have dinner at 10 p.m. and have bright lights on, it doesn't work. right? So it's all a matter of getting these ancient systems in the body aligned. And fasting does it really, really well. So three hours or more prior to sleep, no mm -hmm. food. One hour prior to sleep, no light. I remember yes. in the book. Okay. No light, or you can wear glasses if you want to. And I have, I have a pair of floating around here somewhere. Here, but there's one of my companies called True Dark makes patented circadian rhythm glasses. They're actually red. These are the, the daytime ones. And what uh, what you find there is that red light's okay. So at night. I look a little bit ridiculous to my neighbors because when the sun has gone down, I turn on red lights. And you do this for two things. If you care about the natural world around you, the lights outside your house, especially if they shine up into the sky, they are killing billions of birds a year because the birds get confused by the lights. And there's so much evidence for this. I live in the forest. I have three species of owls live within 100 meters of the house. And if I had bright lights on outside, when I go outside, I can't see the stars, <laughs> but then it resets my timing. I don't like that. So I have red lights on that are sea turtle friendly, even though I'm not by the ocean. And if we were to dim our nighttime lights outdoors and indoors, it would actually help to save the insect life on the planet, as well as make us sleep better and be less hungry. <laughs> it's such an easy hack. So I wear my red glasses at night and my, uh, uh, my lights are, are, I look like I'm in a submarine, to be honest. There's, there's something that I uh, recently came across, a study about a hack in terms of, so if you spend two to 10 minutes, two minutes to 10 minutes, looking at the sun during sunset, low sun, that minimizes the impact of artificial light at night that messes up your circadian, which it is, is interesting. It's more important that you see sunrise. Of course, right? of course. But what's happening here is that the signal to the body that it's morning and night is sunrise and sunset. And you get a very different spectrum of light. That's why you see the yellows, the reds, the golds. And yeah, that is a really good signal. The difficulty, though, is that if you do that and you watch the sunset, which really does turn the volume down, the, the body just knows, oh, it's going to be evening time. But then you sit under a, at a bright table with a chandelier above you shining down right from above you it totally undoes that. So what you want to do is do that and turn the dimmer on the chandelier down. So when we have dinner at night, our dimmers are down. And it, normally, if you look back 20, 30 years, you go to a nice restaurant, there's candlelight that gets dim. Yeah. If you can make your home eating environment a little bit more like that, it really, really has an effect on blood sugar the next day. 
and on how you feel and on how you sleep at night. I've been tracking my sleep for 15 years. I use the Aura Ring now. But before that, I used to sleep with a headband because I was so bad at sleeping. And last night, I got two and a half hours of deep sleep and an hour and a half of REM sleep, which is more than most college students get. You get less of those as you age. So I'm sleeping like a young person because I control those things. So what are the different for people that are watching? And, and just to kind of clarify something. So sunlight during, during daytime, especially sunrise, that's the most important. If you do sunrise and sunset, that's a great way to having both. But the it's ideal... Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. The sunset, saying that you can watch the sunset doesn't negate the importance of lowering and dimming light. I'm just saying it minimizes the impact. So everybody, yeah. if you do all three, sunrise, sunset, and dim lights, then you're, you're it, set. It's as important as food and maybe more important as food uh, or more important than food when it comes to setting the timing systems of your body. So if light's most important, food is second most important. If you line those guys up and okay, light's not perfect, your food's not perfect, but they're mostly aligned, you get so many benefits. And I can measure the difference on my blood sugar response to food using the levels thing. So I just wave my phone to get my blood sugar anytime. The same meal will raise my blood sugar another 20, 30% if I had a late meal and I go to bed late. So the, the next day when I'm eating food that shouldn't raise my blood sugar, it does. So you can basically turn on prediabetes by staying up late and eating late at night. The next day, your body will respond not the way it should. What other, what other harmful effects of, let's say, eating and sleeping an hour later immediately? What other, what other harmful effects? Well, the, the number one thing that happens when you eat late at night is yeah. that the, the energy that's going to digesting the food doesn't go into cleaning the brain. And there's a system in the brain called the glymphatic system. And we only discovered it maybe 10 years ago. And this is a thing that pumps cerebral spinal fluid, clean water into the brain. And it actually drops all the water that's in the cells. So the cells actually shrink. They shed water and all the toxic proteins that build up during the day. One's linked to Alzheimer's. And then you wash them out. It's, it's a brainwash. But if some portion of your energy is going into breaking down a steak in your stomach, instead of doing this system, it doesn't work as well. So you need more sleep and you don't do as good a job of cleaning out your brain. So chronically eating lots of late night meals and then going to sleep with a full stomach reduces the ability of your brain to stay young. Brain aging. So has there been any studies related to that specific habit in Alzheimer's, for example? I haven't. There up. are studies on Alzheimer's um, and fasting and fasting appears to be good for it. On, uh, on Bulletproof Radio, I just interviewed Margaret Paul. She's 81. She's been intermittent fasting for 59 years. And you look at her, and she looks like she's 60. Uh, and she's so full of energy. Her eyes are bright. And she actually does huge amounts of work on trauma release. That's her main practice. In fact, you would like meeting Margaret Paul. Yes. I just wrote yeah, her name. I'll, I can introduce you if you'd like. And she's... One of the things I've learned most of all, especially writing my book, Game Changers, about like, like what do, if I interview 500 people who've done big things in the world, what do they have in common that I can do? So I statistically analyzed their answers to a structured question. And uh, what I found is when I interview people who are 30 years older than me and more, I always get so much wisdom. This is the wisdom of our elders. So anytime I can talk to someone who's done it for decades more than me, the amount of time and energy that it saves me is enormous because I'm like, thank you. You've already been there. Could you like point me in the right direction? So I was blown away both by her trauma work, but just, Hey, I figured this out. I was sick when I was young. I started fasting. It made me better. And to this day for 50 plus years, I don't eat after 545. That's my limit. After that, I just don't do it. So all my friends look old and I don't. <laughs> so there's something to be said for this. That's amazing. One last question about the skipping breakfast. Um, when I read about years ago, sumo wrestlers, sumo wrestlers skip breakfast. Sumo wrestlers may have one or two meals a day and it could be around two o'clock. So it's really mm -hmm. similar to intermittent fasting, except sumo wrestlers end up gaining massive amounts of, yeah, they just gain weight massively and they overeat. So my question is, what, would, what is the difference? Because the only thing that came to mind, I didn't really dig into it, but as I was going through, preparing, through your, you know, preparing for this interview, I was going through your book, that came to mind. I was like, hmm, I would love to ask Dave, but one thing that did come up 
is maybe the excessive workout regimen that they do after waking up before the meal. But that's the only thing that came up. But is there, do you have any thoughts on that? It turns out that, that they're practicing the, st- the tripling down on mTOR we talked about earlier. So they're fasting and then they're exercising and then they're eating. But when they eat, they're eating literally several pounds of steamed rice. I mean, it's a very carbohydrate high diet and they're eating a good amount of fish. So the reason that this is happening is they're overfeeding and they're doing this specifically at the time when the body is most primed to drive energy into cells. Since there's way too much energy and it's right at the time to do that, sure, they're getting a lot of muscle underneath the fat, but they're also putting on fat. If they would swap out half the rice for butter <laughs> and grass-fed meat, they would be uh, a lot leaner and they would, uh, they would look different, but they'd be equally strong. So it's the amount and the type of food. Yeah. And, and this is a really important thing to understand. Calories are a fantasy. Uh, the, half the calories that you burn are through body temperature, the room temperature, through breathing and respiration. Uh, tracking calories on some little device is mostly a fantasy. And yeah. some calories, they're, they're like the prime example, carbohydrates, corn syrup gives you, it makes you fat, gives you fatty liver, gives you gout, uh, raises triglycerides, it's bad for you, but it's a carb. Another carbohydrate is prebiotic fiber, which is one of the fasting hacks. Your body can't even digest that carbohydrate, but they both say 100 calories of carbs on the label, and that feeds a good gut bacteria that convert it into a short chain fat called butyric acid that's anti-inflammatory and pro-ketogenic. And so what, they're both 100 calories. It's like if someone says, Sam, go on a liquid diet. And like, that sounds great but they don't tell you what liquid. And so you're drinking six beers a day. <laughs> that's going to be very different than six waters or six teas, right? So you really have to be precise. And that's why when people say eat this much protein or this many calories or this much fat, if you don't know what fat you're eating or what calories you're eating, it's not a good way to think about food. So a 2000 calorie day diet, you could be eating coal. Coal is high in calories. You can't digest it. Like calories are not a good way to think. What you want to think about is each food has an effect on you. And it's not based on whether it's a protein or a fat or a carb. It's based on what fat is it. Even MCT oil, which is a core part of the Bulletproof diet, it's in Bulletproof yeah. coffee. It's a type of fat that cannot be stored as fat in the body, doesn't get processed by the liver like other fats, and directly converts to energy. And it, it is a saturated fat though, but it's not the same as corn oil, even though they're both fats. So you really have to understand that. Cuddalik was just asking, that was bulletproof brain octane oil. It's a form of MCT oil that can't be stored as fat. And that's something that I've been recommending um, for 10 plus years. It's, it's now become a billion dollar category, but I created that category. <laughs> I'm really, and uh, thousands of people, millions of people are grateful for that. Um, Melissa was just ans- was asking, not uh, probably a few minutes ago about what about midnight snacks? I mean, do I need to answer that? Um, just don't do it. But don't. here's, here's what happens. And this is really important for yes. people listening. Yeah. If you wake up with gnawing hunger, or if you wake up with um, racing thoughts, and you just can't go back to sleep, what happens is you're metabolically unfit. So your body ran out of blood sugar in the middle of the night. And the body's fastest way to get blood sugar is to say, Oh, let me secrete some cortisol and some adrenaline. And that raises blood sugar quickly. Well, if you have a burst of cortisol at three in the morning, you're not going to go back to sleep. You're going to think about all the stuff wrong in your life and you're going to be nervous because these are stress hormones. Well, there is one thing you can do. Actually, there's three things you can do before bed and different ones work for different people. And I talk about this in Fast This Way. So there's a lot of, a lot of what I'm sharing is in the book. So if you guys are interested in reading it, there's, I recorded the audible and all that kind of stuff or do the fasting challenge, fastthisway.com. It's free. Um, so I just want to make sure I get all the info in that I can. The, the three things that you can do if you wake up in the middle of the night or you just really need the midnight snack. One of them is two teaspoons of raw honey. Okay, it needs to be raw. If you put it in hot tea, it's not raw anymore. And raw honey, when you eat a very small amount of that, even during a fast, is usually not enough to break the fast. But what it does is it goes into the liver and it's stored as a carbohydrate store called glycogen. But liver glycogen feeds the brain before muscle glycogen. 
So you can still be in a mostly fasted state, but it gives your brain just a little bump to stay asleep all night long. And that can be life-changing for people. The other thing that works that some people do with the honey, some people do by itself, is they do a little bit of MCT oil. MCT oil provides an alternate fuel source besides blood glucose, and it's more ketogenic, more fasting. You put a little bit of that, even just a teaspoon, blend it into a cup and just water, you shake it up with some water, or some people can just have a teaspoon of it. That also can just prop your energy up so that the brain doesn't go into that panic state when it runs out of energy because it doesn't run out of energy. And it's important, the honey has to be raw and it needs to be MCT oil. Coconut oil doesn't do the same thing. So, okay, okay. So I hope, Melissa, that was a sufficient answer. Um, in terms of the book itself, I haven't done this before, but before I, before I touch upon this, I have a question, because there are two explanations to this. How did you know I was gonna get into the Seco diet? You either have a copy or you're psychic. You learned something in the cave. So I just wanna double check. Um, I, I might be psychic. I, I actually think everyone, when you plug into your intuition, we're all way more aware of what's going on in the world. But I do have a, a long track record of being, uh, it sounds really egotistical to say being right first, but to say being there first. You know, I'm, I am the first guy to sell anything over the internet. You know, I, I'm not Jeff Bezos, right? You know, he commercialized that way better, but the very first product. So I've done this throughout my career. I just, I, I kind of read the tea leaves and see where things are going. And I'm a, I'm a futurist. So the, the Seco thing has to be, has to be destroyed. But the guy who influenced me most there is Gary Tobbs, who wrote a book called Good Calories, Bad Calories about, geez, about 14 years ago. That book is one of the best science books I think I've ever seen. And he talks about the dangers of high insulin. Um, there are dangers of low insulin too. Uh, but um, he was the guy really was just put the, put the stake in the heart of calories. They're a bad way to think about it. And, and something else, when we talk about Seco, the calories in, calories out. If you still are, are of the mindset listening to this, that, okay, Dave, you, know, you and Sam are wrong. Calories really matter. And Newton's you know, conservation of mass and all that kind of stuff. Here's the proof. I run a small farm. I have 32 acres and we raise sheep, we raise pigs. And I've studied agriculture a lot, especially as I've been one of the leaders in the we have to eat grass fed food to save the planet and be healthy. When industrial farmers are raising cows, they take a concentrated mold toxin called zeralinone. They buy a pellet of it in a form called xeranol. And you can Google this, Z-E-A-R-A-N-O-L. It's a synthetic estrogen made by mold that's a thousand times stronger than the estrogen that's naturally found in animals or humans. They put it in the cow's ear and it melts in and enters their circulation. And when that happens, the cow gets fat on 30% less calories. Okay. If calories in, calories out is a real thing, it's impossible to make a drug that makes you fat on less calories, except that it happens all the time. One of the reasons that I was overweight when I weighed 300 pounds is that I had more estrogen than my mom and less testosterone. <laughs> and I lived in a house with toxic mold that made synthetic estrogens, right? So hormones really matter. Thyroid hormone really matters. And for you to believe it's just about calories, if I just cut my calories, I'm going to be in a, in a good place. No, it's about what are the calories and when did you eat them? Those both trump the number of calories. And, and to put a really big point on calories in, calories out, at the very beginning of the blog, this is going back 11 years now, I think, I, or maybe actually this was before I started the blog, I was pressure testing the Bulletproof diet. And I said, you know what? I'm going to eat 4,500 calories a day. And I'm going to cut my sleep to five hours or less. And I'm going to stop exercising. And I'm going to do it for a month. And then I'm going to gain three pounds. And I was eating what I recommend, you know, grass fed. I was eating a Bulletproof coffee. I was intermittent fasting with it. At the end of the month, I actually lost weight. And I should have gained 20 pounds because I was eating so many extra calories. How did I lose weight on eating too many calories? It's not supposed to be possible, except that's how things work. And if I'd have eaten all corn syrup and you know, bread, it would have been a very different result. And so I'm not re recommending that anyone overfeeds. It is not good for you to eat too many calories. But if it's possible to eat too many calories and lose weight, then we have a problem when we think it's calories in, calories out. It's just not real. I love that example in terms of, okay, so, you know, 100 calories soda versus 100 calories, you know, something healthy. Yep. How would you feel at the end of it? 
<laughs> that, that's such a simple way to put it. Yeah. Because it's the same number of calories. And if it, the calories are what matter, not what's, what the calories represent, then, then this, this wouldn't work. But it makes perfect sense. And the idea of you gaining, losing weight, and even though you've, you've ingested more calories, suggests that there's something else. And I think the type of food creates inflammation. More yeah. inflammation equals more weight at the same time. You reduce inflammation, re reducing inflammation is an indirect way of weight loss. That's one of the takeaways for me when I was reading the book. Yeah. It, you, can, you can think about inflammation is it's if you combine air and food and you make energy, you don't have inflammation. If you combine air and food and you make less energy, the extra energy goes into inflammation. So inflammation is a direct sign that you're not doing a good job of converting your food into electrons. And there can be lots of reasons for inflammation, but it's always manifested as mitochondrial weakness, which is really, uh, really interesting because that means if you can fix your ability to make energy, it works. And to your point about how do you feel after you eat, there are a lot of people who say, I'm going to eat a health food that makes them feel hungry and weak. And I'm talking about kale <laughs> and lots of other things that are identified as health foods. There's no one on earth who's ever eaten a big kale salad, a raw kale salad, and afterwards going, man, I am just vibing with energy. I'm so full, I couldn't eat for four hours. No, as soon as you eat kale, you're like, where's the dried hummus or whatever, you know, whatever else you like to eat because it just creates hunger. So it's supposed to be healthy. When you eat a food that's actually healthy for you, you are satisfied, you are full, and you don't think about food for a long time. And it turns out kale is full of two different toxins that trigger cravings, but people don't know it. So just because something is supposed to be healthy, like oatmeal, and you eat oatmeal, your blood sugar will skyrocket. I mean, it's crazy to see what happens there. It's not a great breakfast. Breakfast in itself isn't that good, but oatmeal, which is supposed to be healthy because it has fiber, no, it's a massive sugar bomb, basically. So there's one thing that I wanted to mention from the very beginning, which is consistency and inconsistency. You, let me read this quote directly from your book. Well, it's not from the book, I just wrote it. It's basically, I think it was, it was about hypoxic states. You oh, yeah. In a hypoxic state. Uh, denying it, denying the brain, I guess, consistency makes your body stronger to survive the illusion of an inconsistent world. I love that. Because here's the thing. Um, in terms of uh, weak stress, and you talk about weak stress to extend life. Weak stress. I mean, you got fasting. That kind of creates an inconsistent... But when you do fasting, what you did talk about is break the cycle. Don't keep doing the same fast. Don't do it every day. Interrupt it. And so fasting is a way to induce weak stress to allow us to adapt and to be more resilient. Cold exposure, breathing, slow breathing, or breath hold on an inhale or Wim Hof, we're talking about flexibility of the chemoreceptors in order for, you know, for us to, have, to tolerate higher CO2 without us feeling any form of anxiety. Um, I remember James Nestor was talking about the CO2 therapy for that. So this is tolerance. This is a way to induce weak stress to help us adapt. Exercise is another one. We adapt by growing, by getting stronger. So interrupting a pattern in order for us to adapt, because change equals stress in a way, because change creates an unknown future in that moment. So on a molecular level, we don't know mm -hmm. what's going to so we have to adapt to make sure we overcome it when it happens again. And that's the whole idea. Uh, but it also promotes resilience and through adaptation, which is huge. On the other hand, this is inconsistent. This is the power of inconsistency. But now we have consistency. And let me use a medical term, homeostasis. In mm -hmm. order for us to have that long enough for the body to heal because there's nothing else the body needs to redirect energy towards. There's not a threat, there's nothing. Blood doesn't need to be redirected anywhere. You, there's that homeostasis. So I guess the question is how do you, I don't know, this is an open question, by the way. This is not something that I've thought, out, thought of previously, but how do you, because sleep, for example, the body works with us when we connect with it. If I sleep at different times, but I wake up at exactly the same time at 6 a.m. in the morning, even though I sleep sometimes at 1 a.m., sometimes at 8 p.m., the body learns that the constant, which is its anchor, is 6 a.m. 
So I may sleep eight hours a day every day, but sometimes through mental and physical exhaustion for that day, I may need an extra hour because that changes over time. I may need an extra hour for that day to compensate. The body mm -hmm. knows that I wake up at 6 a.m. So it, I get sleepy an hour earlier because that's the anchor. But most, a lot of people sleep at different times, wake up at different times, and there is no consistency for the body to kind of work with, if that makes sense. So yeah. how, do you, how do you benefit from consistency and, and inconsistency? I like, love this question. Um, showing the body that it will regularly be exposed to environments that cause, that, where it will be required to be strong mm -hmm. is really important. And each time you expose yourself to something like, say, a cold shower, which I write about in the book, I've been uh, talking about cold therapy since I started the blog, and it's really become much more popular. Wim Hof is a good friend. And um, just telling the body, you know, I'm going to run cold water over my face for one minute. You know, face <coughs> and chest is where the most receptors are. The cells in the body, which are dumb, you know, you're smart, but your cells aren't that smart. They go, oh, man, there might be an ice age. And at any time... I may be required to be able to turn on heat production quickly. And then it has to self-assess and go, hmm, some of my cells can't do that. I thought they were good enough, but now they're not good enough. So it will take those old weak cells and it will kill them and it will build young, stronger ones. This is that process called autophagy. And it's important to do that. And same thing, you go to the gym, you know, you lift something and it says, wow, occasionally I'm going to have to put out more power than I really wanted to. Therefore, I'm going to make sure that I have enough cells to be able to do that and that they're metabolically fit. And there's all kinds of, of these are called hormetic stressors or the what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Yes. We have a problem now, though, because all stress affects you. If, you're in, if you just lost uh, you know, your life's fortune, I did do that once when I lost $6 million and I was 28. <laughs> um, if you're going through a bad breakup and I've been divorced, uh, if you're, uh, you, know, you had a death in the family, right? You had a virus, uh, you got in a car accident. These are stressors, right? You're just having a really rough time. You're feeling lonely. Okay. So is weightlifting. So is a long fast. So sometimes if you stack too much stress on, then it takes you out of this um, homeostasis. So you kind of look at life as, as you want to have a strong average, but you want to have peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. But if you just had a flat line, the body's like, I only have to be prepared for a flat line and you can't handle a peak. Right, So this is why you end up saying, All right, I'm going to regularly expose myself to things like going without food for a little while, like occasionally doing some squats. It doesn't have to be that often. Occasional cold exposure, occasionally running really fast. The body knows it better be ready. But if you let your body believe that there's no need for it to be ready, it will not be ready. Because if there's one thing that nature wants you to do, it's to be lazy. And lazy just means to not, not burn one single calorie that isn't necessary, right? And okay, then why would you have cells that can turn on heat quickly when you don't need them? Why would you have cells that are strong when you don't need them? And the thing is, though, if you go do what I did and you work out an hour and a half a day, six days a week in the gym, then you haven't recovered. And so anytime you have extra stress, you recover, you eat more, you eat better, you sleep extra, you do whatever is necessary. So it's exposure, recovery, exposure, recovery. But we live in a world now where it's exposure, 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 like lean in, push, 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 push. But if you don't sleep when you're done and you don't have peace when you're done, then you don't actually recover. And that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. No, it's what doesn't kill me makes me inflamed. And you don't want to go there. I love that because it's, it's what kills, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger if I have a recovery period to strengthen myself because of it. So the idea is if I'm, if I'm exposed to something, I need to adapt to it. The, the point of the exposure is to get stronger, but I can't get stronger if I'm exposed to something else and I don't have the energy or the time to rest. If there is no recovery period, the exposure is going to lead to inflammation and exhaustion. And mm. muscle exercise and the idea of exercise is a metaphor. If you keep exercising the muscle, you're damaging the muscle. You need recovery time in order for them. Actually, most, you know, the most important aspect of working out is sleep and, <laughs> and food rather than the actual workout. It's just a trigger. But if you don't then give the body what it needs, you're not going to get the benefits of the workout in the first place. So, so yeah, I, I completely, yeah, I love that. The idea of 
exposure, recovery. It's that simple. And that's the answer. And we live in a world right now where there's micro stressors. So if we want to talk about good stress, mm-hmm. faster, um, interruption equals stress. So if I'm constantly interrupted, constantly interrupted all day, from notifications. By the way, my notif- anybody that is asking, because I remember I had this question, <laughs> zero notifications. I don't have notifications on my phone. I think that's the best thing I've ever done for my yep. social media life. No notifications. Constant interruption equals constant stress. And that's not good stress because it's not stress that I'm creating for myself and it's not stress that I can control. Well, now I can because I just eliminated the whole thing through notification disabling. But this is what fasting does as well. You are selectively, temporarily, completely in control, triggering the body in order for it to adapt and get stronger. And that's, it, that's how yes. it's selective. selective. That's the key. It's choice. And that's what now, gives us the opportunity. Now you're making me regret not putting a notifications fast into fast this way. <laughs> uh, I... I am a, a, an unusual person. There aren't many people who are 48 who had their own computer and they were eight. I had a computer before Microsoft was started. Um, and in fact, actually, that's not true. Microsoft was started. And my mom was the first employee of Microsoft, the company that became Microsoft when she was pregnant with me. So I guess they were around. They were just small. But uh, so I maybe lived a different life than most people um, who are my age. And because I was a very early internet guy, um, I went through all of the like inf- internet addiction stuff when I was maybe 22 in college. And like if my email would go down, I'd start freaking out. We didn't have Facebook and all that. But when I started my neuroscience company called 40 Years of Zen, where people do a, a, like a five-day brain upgrade, you can actually see with the equipment that we use to monitor brain waves, when an alert comes on, your whole brain waves change and, and you immediately go into this beta because it might be a threat. So the automated systems body, look, look look, and it totally takes you out of peace and flow and getting stuff done. So I have my alerts turned off. I don't, if you email me, I don't need to know right now. I'll check my email when I'm ready. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, you, you follow me on Instagram. I don't need a notification that you followed me. I can look at my total followers, whether they went up or they went down. I can choose to look and engage with people, but letting uh, the phone just steal my attention like that. So notifications are absolutely toxic. They probably cause food cravings too. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> your stress levels go up. You're constantly wow. in fight or flight and then you're going to want yeah. some candy. I, I believe yeah. that. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Um, I have to mention this because um, I paused it midway because, you know, there are things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I've never done this before. I've, I've always read the book prior to interviewing the authors. This is the first time I exclusively, I started reading the book and then I started listening to, the, to your Audible version and my preparation was from that, the entire book. And I was listening. Oh, cool. And I, I just wanted to mention that I, I love the fact that you read and narrated your own book with your own voice because a lot of authors not to say that that's a bad thing. It's a shame, but not to say it's a bad thing, because I understand that there are authors that may believe that they don't have the right professional uh, training in order to deliver it. And it's better for people to get the content in the best possible way, the best possible voice to listen to in order to absorb the information. But I do believe that something is missed, something is lost in the authenticity when the author of the book doesn't read the words that the author has written. So I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you for calling that out. And, and you're welcome. I, in my first book, I, I wanted to read the Audible for it, but I talked to my publisher and they said, look, it's a lot of work. It usually takes five or 10 days to record it. Uh, and you want a pleasant experience and you should have a professional narrator read it. So I did that, but I always it always felt wrong because if you go back in the beginning, there was the word and reading your own book in your own voice. I think it, it's not just authenticity. I think there's an energetic aspect to it as well. So I actually took voice lessons from Roger Love. He's the guy who taught uh, Bradley Cooper, how to sing to be in that movie with Lady Gaga, the star is born and has yeah. been a big voice coach. So I did that. And I, because of my podcast, you know, it's top hundred podcasts on iTunes. So I have good audio engineering so we set up a recording studio and I sat there for days and read every single word that I had written. 
And it was, it was a really positive experience too, because when you do that, you end up seeing the final product. And when you write a book, you see your words hundreds of times and you re-edit this and you move this around. And I mean, it is, is like, it's crafting its art to write a good book like that. So you have all the ideas, but they're a little bit jumbled. But when you read right through it, I think it goes into my tissues better. <laughs> and I think when people hear it, uh, that it has a bigger impact on them because these are my words and this is actually me reading them. So there's some subtle, hard to explain thing there, but thanks for recognizing it. I, I think this is the best read I've ever done. And it was, it is work though. It, it is, um, and it is something people think, oh, you know, authors make a lot of money from books. Writing books is a terrible way to make money. Uh, my hourly rate for writing my book is the lowest pay of anything that I get. I write books because it's knowledge that I think is worth more to the people who read them and the stuff that then it'll take them to read it or to listen to it. Um, if, uh, if I didn't write books, I would be less happy and I wouldn't structure my thoughts as well. Uh, so I do it for that reason because I think it, they make the world a better place. But man, the amount of time it takes to write and then read a book, it's thousands and thousands of hours, um, but it's a labor of love. And I think any good writer um, would, uh, would acknowledge that. Um, and probably uh, Ryan Holiday has a book about that called Perennial Seller. And anyone listening who wants to be a, a writer or just the best in your field of creativity Perennial Seller by Ryan Holiday is a profound book because he talks about like the energy that goes into writing. So thanks for picking that up, Sam. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I'm aware of time. And uh, I think we had a conversation about that, that um, we, I don't know if Instagram is going to allow me to upload it if we go beyond the two hours. So I just wanted to, okay. to, to, to yeah, to kind of, but is there anything, is there anything you'd like to, to finish off with? final words. I, I have two things. One, everyone's asking about what am I doing with this? That is microdose nicotine. So if I was in the Middle East, it would be a shisha, except this doesn't have the downside of inhaling stuff. And it is a very tiny fraction of nicotine, which mimics exercise and is anti Alzheimer's. I have a show on Bulletproof Radio with the university scientist who studied it since 1986 as an anti Alzheimer anti aging treatment. So oral nicotine is different than smoking, but that's what I'm doing when I interview. I, it dials your brain in in a really good way. So I, I give better interviews that way. So that's what that is. And the second thing is, guys, if there was too much information here for you, check out, just go to fastestway.com, sign up for the fasting challenge, and I'll spend two weeks teaching you everything about how to fast. And I don't want anything from you for that. I just want you to know this because it will be worth it in your life. When we are well-fed and well-nourished and our cells work well, we are wired for that fourth F word, friend. We are wired to be nice and to be kind to each other. But if we're not well nourished and we're at low energy all the time, we don't have the energy to be nice to each other. So I think that fasting and eating better are some of the fast, maybe sleeping better, are some of the fastest ways that we can make the world a kinder, nicer place. And that's why this matters so much. So thank you for listening. And thank you, Sam, for an amazing interview. Thank you, Dave. Um, for everyone, I'm going to be posting a story, a video in the story right now with a swipe up as soon as we're done. So you could just swipe up and go to Fast This Way, the challenge directly. So you can actually sign up for that. Because I think that's an amazing gift that you can either send to other people or you can do it yourself as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much I would love to go through that I didn't even get a chance to cover. Uh, I always fail miserably with every single author. And I always ask if it's possible for us to do another follow-up session at some point, if you're sure. Open. It would be an absolute honor to have you again. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Dave, for, for writing this book, because it's such a beautiful capturing of everything that people need in terms of spirituality with the science. I love that. And I look forward to uh, connecting with you again uh, soon. And I wish you an amazing month. Man. You too, Sam. Have an amazing month. And guys, thanks for listening uh, and learning and just share the knowledge. The best thing you can do is try it change your energy, change how you look and everyone around you will ask you what you did and then you can tell them uh, and it'll be surprising, but this can spread and that's what it's meant to do. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dave. Have an incredible month and I look forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you so much. Good deal. All right, bye. Take care.